So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm happy to chair the next um, session. Um, my name is Emmi Oikari. I come from the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, uh, where I'm um, leading the unit for development finance and private sector cooperation. And uh, the topic uh, of our session is uh, the World Development Report 2022 finance for an equitable recovery. Uh, first, we will hear about it and then, uh, then discuss about it. And uh, the report um, looks at the role of finance in the economic uh, recovery from the pandemic. And, uh, and obviously, the report highlights the challenges as well as the, the consequences of the, of the crisis. Uh, it should be noted that the report was, uh, was published before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which, uh, which some of you already mentioned this morning as, uh, as uh, of course, um, only making the, the situation even worse, uh, especially in terms of um, energy and food security. Um, when I was reviewing the, the report, what really stood out uh, was, the, was the call for transparency. Some, something we also have discussed already during, uh, during this morning. Um, but let me now introduce Leora Klapper, who will uh, present the report uh, together with some of your colleagues, um, I, I was just told. Uh, Leora is uh, the lead economist in the finance and private sector research group at the World Bank. Uh, her publications focus on corporate and household finance, entrepreneurship and risk management. And I was also, also very interested to learn that her current research studies the impact of digital financial services, especially for women. But now, Laura, please, the floor is, the digital floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to join you today to discuss our 2022 World Development Report, which we launched uh, last spring, um, Finance for an Equitable Recovery. Um, which unfortunately has become more, our, our, our recommendations have become even more urgent in the current environment. Um, this report was drafted by an interdisciplinary team from both the World Bank and the IFC. I'm joined this morning with a colleague from IFC. Um, and we hope that our report will elevate these issues among uh, government priorities during the recovery. And so, like your conference, the report touches on encouraging sustainable private and sovereign debt and the importance of green finance. Um, to, to, to summarize, um, our report focuses on the unprecedented financial and economic risks that were created or worsened by the pandemic and the pandemic responses and more recent macroeconomic threats caused by rising fuel and food prices and the war in Ukraine, growing climate risks, which have all hindered a swift recovery from the pandemic um, and outlines concrete steps that policymakers can take to address them. So the global public health, the global public health crisis that was triggered by the pandemic quickly led to an economic crisis, which increased global poverty and inequality and dealt the biggest setback to global poverty in decades. In 2020, economic activity contracted in 90% of countries and global poverty increased for the first time in a generation. And so while the wealthiest 40% of the global population continued today to recover, we're still seeing the income of the poorest adults continuing to decline, and expected to decline further. For example, the World Bank's 2022 Poverty and Shared Prosperity Report shows that global progress in reducing extreme poverty has effectively come to a complete halt. And so even as countries around the world were struggling to contain the spread of COVID-19 and managing the health costs of the pandemic, governments were quickly implementing an encompassing a really unprecedented response of fiscal, monetary, and financial sector policies, all aimed at limiting the worst immediate economics of the health crisis on households and businesses. A theme we really pull out in the report is the macroeconomic, imp the impact of macroeconomic policy on households and firms, these micro effects of macro policies. And so we collected data showing that these included direct cash transfers, debt repayment moratorias, as well as central banks' unconventional monetary policies that we're, again, we're seeing today the ramifications of, such as asset purchase programs that were effective in pumping liquidity into the financial sector and were used by 27 emerging markets for the very first time during the pandemic. 
So for example, early in the crisis, the Philippines took 22 measures to support the banking sector, 11 to improve liquidity and funding, and six to support the payment system. And so in the midst of the crisis, these policy measures provided much needed liquidity support to households and, and helped avert a wave of loan defaults that could have threatened the stability of the financial sector. However, policymakers around the world needed to achieve a balance, and now we're trying to achieve that balance between providing enough support to prevent the worst human costs of really the growing economic and political instabilities um, while limiting longer term risks, such as growing sovereign debt, rising inflation, and expanding non performing loans in distressed firms. So, our conceptual framework illustrates a central message of the report that the numerous mutually reinforcing channels that connect the financial health of households, firms, financial institutions, and governments can trigger a global financial chain reaction. And this means that elevated financial risks in one sector can spill over and destabilize the entire economy. And again, we wrote this in the context of the pandemic and the recovery, although unfortunately, there's really tremendous urgency to these risks given uh, rising fuel and food prices um, and the ongoing war in Ukraine. So to give some simple examples, inclusive access to finance, um, <coughs> excuse me, to financial services, offers households and businesses financial resilience to economic shocks and unanticipated expenses that many in the world are today experiencing and allow firms to invest uh, in the recovery. But banks confronting decline in loan quality tend to tighten their lending. And these reductions typically hit lower income households and small businesses the hardest, setting up a negative feedback loop between financial sector performance and real economic activity with the potential to increase income inequality. And so official statistics seem to show that non-performing loans in some markets are growing. And there's reason to be worried. For example, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, global household debt had increased by more than 30% of the share of GDP since 2008. And household balance sheet data showed that in low and middle income countries, only half of all households had the liquidity to sustain basic consumption beyond three months. And business performance also seems to have been affected. I've been looking at data from using uh, with the MasterCard Economic Institute that suggests that globally, business failure rates have doubled in 2020 and 2021 above the 2019 and 2018 baselines. Lo uh, loan defaults can now sharply increase and private debts can quickly become public debt as governments are forced into bailouts. Household and firms suffering from lower income and revenue also pay less in taxes. In addition, when the financial position of the public sector deteriorates from both higher debt and debt servicing, this may weaken the government's ability to support households and firms in needs. And we also discuss global risks, such as the rising interest rates and inflation risks, which were a little more hypothetical when we wrote the report, but are not today, um, which as Augustine Carson's explained nicely in a 2020 speech on central banks and inequality, inflation is a regressive tax that disproportionately hits the most disadvantaged because the poor sees that the wages erode, but typically don't have inflation resilient assets to hedge their risks. And therefore the responsibility of central banks macro stabilization role can help make a more equitable society. So the policy challenges going forward will be to ensure sustainable debt burdens and uninterrupted access to formal credit. So that first households and businesses, especially low income households and small businesses maintain access to financial services that offer financial resilience to economic shocks and unanticipated expenses and allow firms to invest in their recovery. And second, governments and financial institutions can support the recovery and provide adequate financing, including for investments in all the services that governments need to support, such as education and health. As our report focuses on four priority areas and policy measures that government should take now to avoid major financial upheaval. First, increasing transparency and reducing the share of non-performing loans to ensure banks can continue to lend. Second, to ensure effective procedures to discard distressed debt including out-of-court mediation and conciliation, which World Bank uh, experiences have shown can be especially beneficial to small businesses and individuals. Third, to ensure continued access to credit. And fourth, to manage sovereign debt sustainably. So let me run through uh, the first two and then I'll pass on to my colleagues to talk in a little more depth. Um, so the first area for policy action that we discussed in the report is a need to address risk to financial stability to ensure that banks can continue to lend to support the recovery. 
So one of the main recommendations of the report is that problem assets must be recognized and dealt with promptly. The faster the non-performing loans are addressed, the sooner banks and microfinance lenders will be able to support the recovery. And we bring, out, we bring the evidence why timely management of non-performing loans is so important, really highlighting three reasons. First, that high non-performing loan levels burden all levels of an economy. We discussed in the report research showing that delayed action can cut off access to credit, destroy jobs, and discourage entrepreneurship. Second, how high non-performing loans depress economic growth. As for example, in the well-documented case of the lost, uh, genera- the Japan's lost decade of growth. And third, that without swift policy responses to hidden loan distress, we could also see an increase in evergreening. This is a continuous rolling over of zombie loans to businesses that are weak with little or no chance of returning to health and politicized government interference in debt resolution. This ultimately translates into lower economic output, investment, and employment. But the negative cycle of high-performing loans leading to low economic growth is not inevitable. Establishing an effective NPL resolution strategy that involves regulatory authorities and the private sector uh, together, working together, is an urgent priority. And there are many benefits of early and decisive action. First, unambiguous regulations to identify non-performing loans allows lenders and regulators to assess the magnitude of the issue and take prompt action. As you mentioned earlier, the transparency is a critical theme, transparency on NPLs, on distressed uh, firms. Second, building banks' operational capacity to deal with a significant increase in NPLs can improve the efficient resolution of distressed assets and free up resources for credit intermediation. And third, authorities should be prepared to quickly assist troubled banks while always prioritizing and exhausting private sector-led and funded solutions before resorting to bailouts. And so experience shows that taking action allows non-performing loans to be brought to sustainable levels. The objective should not be to pursue zero level non-performing loans, but to have banks taking on a level of risk that doesn't compromise their financial soundness. And so in the report, we highlight some examples of countries that have successfully equipped their financial sector to address rising levels of non-performing loans. For example, Serbia established a national NPL working group to reduce stubbornly high levels of NPLs in the aftermath of the 2007-2009 global financial crisis that effectively uh, recapitalized and strengthened their banking sector. The second risk we discuss is debt sustainability. And so a wave of loan defaults can destabilize financial institutions and create contingent liabilities for their governments. There's a risk of zombie firms and politicized government interference in debt resolution. Ineffective insolvency regimes can reduce access to credit, again, especially for riskier, smaller firms and households, by reducing creditors' confidence that both that they can force their rights in the case of default and collect in the case of default. Delayed actions can cut off access to credit, destroy jobs, discourage entrepreneurship, these governments should prioritize strengthening formal insolvency frameworks, including conciliation and mediation. It's not easy to pass through bankruptcy laws, especially during a crisis. However, a growing number of out-of-court procedures have been very effective, especially for SMEs. And history shows that insolvency reforms that encourage out-of-court debt workouts can be effective at bringing down non-performing loan rates. Efficient liquidation procedures can facilitate market exit of these zombie, non-viable firms. And that hybrid out-of-court arrangements that reduce the extent of court involvement in the restructuring can ease the burden on overcrowded courts and reduce the costs, especially for smaller businesses. So we bring lessons learned from the MSME insolvency reform during the Asian financial crisis in the late 1990s, early 2000s. For example, in Indonesia, a judicial reform program enacted in the aftermath of the Asian financial crisis helped to reduce the time needed to conclude an SME insolvency from 72 months in 2004 to 13 months in 2012. We also discussed the comprehensive and ongoing insolvency reforms in India, starting in the 2016 overhaul of the business and personal insolvency framework, which more than doubled the recovery rate for creditors, although backlogs remain an issue. In response to the economic impact of COVID in April 2021, the government of India added a simplified framework for insolvency of small businesses, which might ease the demand and backlog for the corporate restructuring framework. And Colombia has introduced a temporary fast-track restructuring framework that's being administrated by the Chamber of Commerce for MSMEs.
So before passing the floor to my colleague, let me mention spotlights that are woven through the report, focusing on development finance, including the regulation of microfinance institutions and the role of contained and well-governed uh, partial credit guarantees. But we also discuss the importance of strong financial markets to accelerate the transformation towards a sustainable world economy. Examples of how regulators can incentivize green investments, such as mandating higher risk provisioning for loans to sectors engaged in non-sustainable activities. We also discuss the role of capital markets, which was discussed earlier, um, and how the economic stress arising from the pandemic propelled the expansion of sovereign, sustainable green, blonde, green blue bond issuances. Um, although there's no conclusive cross-country patterns, some sovereign green and social bond issuances have paved the way for similar debt issuances by the private sector. So some suggestive examples how government issuances could crowd in private bank issuances include Chile, who in 2019 became the first green sovereign bond issuer in Latin America. And soon after, a large private Chilean bank issued a green bond to raise funds for renewable energy projects. So let me start, um, let me see, uh, is Rita here? Um, okay, so let me uh, actually pass the floor uh, first to my colleague, uh, Benny uh, Sanito, an economist in the Economic Analysis Department of the F uh, IFC. Great. Benny. Thank you, Leora, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, so far, uh, Leora, we've heard from Leora that the, the report highlights the need to address outstanding credit, resolve balance sheets, uh, challenges that banks and borrowers uh, are facing. Um, where I we turn with with the contribution that I'll, I'll I'll share with you right now is on the impact of the crisis on uh, the bank's abilities and the economy's abilities to generate new credit, and particularly for those segments like the MSMEs or lower income segments uh, that were harder to lend to uh, to begin with. So we highlight three main policy messages. Um, the first, which brings in the, the first two bullet points here on the slide. Uh, relates to the, the need to create uh, an enabling environment for responsible lending innovation. Um, this can help mitigate the heightened risk and uncertainties in the short run, or as uh, we're seeing, uh, the short run is, is extending a little bit because of compounding elements uh, around it. Uh, and um, But also in the long term, it can help make markets more inclusive and resilient um, to, to future shocks. Some, uh, some of these enablers include uh, policies around uh, greater data access by lenders, uh, both in terms of new types of alternative data to help fill the gaps that uh, traditional credit information is leaving, but also especially important for emerging markets to keep building on uh, what we would consider traditional credit information systems and financial infrastructure, both in the forms of uh, upgraded payment system, asset registries, uh, and frameworks for allowing secure transactions that really can help improve the data quality on which uh, financial Check your connection. We can't hear you now. Still not. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Laura, we can't hear you either, but uh, it seems that you can hear each other. <laughs> Still no. How about now? <laughs> 
previous panel and their okay. audio went away now, a couple of times. Now we can hear you. Great. Oh, fantastic. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Hi. So, Should I keep going? Or, yes, um, yes, please do. Okay. So, so a second enabler um, that we identify here is the, the need to update uh, risk assessment and management tools for financial institutions. And, and this is, again, uh, a survey of, of our financial institutions I'll tell you a bit more about later, shows that this uh, has been particularly infrequent uh, among, uh, among financial institutions in, in the post-crisis um, time, so in 2020 and 2021. Um, a third enabler would be uh, enabling innovations in products as well as in the types of institutions that lend to MSMEs. And I know there were some discussions about MBFI lending in the previous session, uh, but innovators um, such as uh, data-driven digital lenders and embedded finance providers, while they you know, can lead to some concerns and needs to update regulations, have the potential of uh, bringing in uh, different risk appetites and, and, and different potentials uh, for, for reaching uh, such underserved segments. Another uh, recommendation that we, we bring uh, forward in, in, in this work is the importance of balancing these innovations with appropriate regulation and infrastructure to counter some of the risks, uh, and also uh, particularly those related to financial literacy and cybersecurity. Uh, furthermore, we, we can recognize the, in, in the, in the uh, draft, the, sorry, Leora, just one, uh, still on the first uh, slide, recognize that the partial credit guarantees may need to continue. Uh, they were a central policy tool for uh, through the crisis, and they may need to continue to be in place uh, for a while longer to help balance the risk and returns for lenders. Uh, as economic conditions improve, however, we would expect uh, that these guarantees are progressively narrowed in terms of eligibility to the sectors and customers that they serve, and uh, they can possibly turn to lever to uh, and be leveraged to reduce some of the risk associated with longer term investments uh, for example, some of the uh, climate-related ones uh, that were discussed in previous panels. Uh, so now we can move to the next slide. Uh, as, as we mentioned, the lockdown um, that, that emerged in 2020 in many economies and the shock to the economic activity that we saw uh, over at least two years uh, has heightened credit risk. Uh, what is somewhat unique uh, from this crisis is that uh, lenders saw their visibility uh, on the borrower's capacity and willingness to repay loans, particularly impaired during this time, and also uh, saw more limited options for recourse uh, in, in event of a default. Uh, and so these challenges uh, kind of, uh, as we have seen, have led to a constraint in credit standards uh, across many economies. And in the chart, we, we have an analysis across country that shows uh, several quarters of consecutive tightening um, across across markets in credit standards. And while the situation went better, improved in 2021, uh, 2022 is showing again uh, a shift towards tightening. Um, what I present here is actually instead uh, data from a survey of IFC uh, client financial institutions, about 200 of them uh, across emerging markets, uh, that was conducted at the end of 2020 and at the end of 2021. And by 2021 end, we were seeing a very positive outlook on what uh, the future and, and the future of the recovery would have looked like. Uh, and we were seeing already significant signs of recovery. At that point, two thirds of respondents had returned to pre-crisis operation levels uh, and expected to fully recover by 2020. Um, liquidity had held very well, um, thanks also to a strong performance of deposits, uh, uh, which were uh, also a feature of many of our client financial uh, microfinance institutions. Um, there was a focus of IFC uh, in, in the late 2000s, uh, 2010s, in terms of uh, working with microfinance institutions to broaden their uh, fundraising uh, platforms. Um, but collection levels, again, at the end of 2021, were still a challenge for over half of the lenders that we interviewed. And MPLs increased compared to pre-crisis levels, although not at the levels that we were expecting. We see, and, and you can see it here in the uh, kind of last bar chart on, on this chart, we see that the impact on MPLs that we were seeing by the end of 2021 was almost exclusively focused on low and lower middle income countries institutions. So uh, inversely proportional to the amount of policy support that the economies and this uh, financial sector had received uh, through the crisis. Um, so in this case, we see um, 
uh, that there was a, an increase between uh, 2019 and 2021 among the institutions in our sample, of course, of about 40 percent uh, in the MPL rates, which which is substantial. Um, we can move to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned earlier, credit tightening was 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 a concern. Um, uh, credit standards uh, towards uh, overall the private sector, but particularly the the uh, SME sectors. Uh, we're tightening. Uh, we saw this across economies. What uh, we see also from our client financial institutions is that 46% of them still maintain tighter credit standards compared to pre-crisis by the end of 2021. And again, as a reminder, at the end, by the end of 2021, econo most economies had rebounded significantly from a from a GDP perspective. It was certainly an expansion, uh, expansionary period, which was uh, then uh, met with. Um, tightening conditions that occurred uh, early in 2022. Uh, but in 2020, uh, by the end of 2021, credit standards were tighter because the outlook for businesses was still deemed to be particularly risky because the impact of the last two years on the economic situation of financial institutions was, was, was a challenge and because of this visibility and recourse challenges that we were, uh, that I highlighted earlier. Uh, it was more difficult for lenders to assess credit risk and the quality of collateral was um, a challenge. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Um, so um, what we do highlight uh, in, in this chapter, in addition to kind of framing the risk and the challenges to lending is, is what are some of the uh, opportunities that are coming uh, uh, our way in terms of uh, in terms of enabling financial institutions to be uh, better at managing risk uh, uh, and, and and avoid a credit crunch vis-a-vis. -vis. Primarily on uh, one important uh, digital dividend that was produced by the crisis, which is that business surveys and industry data show that markets um, uh, witnessed a, a growth in the adoption of technology, both by businesses and consumers uh, following the crisis. Much of it was forced uh, by the lockdown. Uh, much of it just gained priority as a result of, uh, of the events uh, during those times. So we see payments and technology adoption uh, grow. Um, this kind of allows us to uh, uh, highlight some of the strategies that lender can adopt uh, to uh, um, meet this heightened risk and uncertainty. Uh, but as many of you will notice, uh, some many of the ideas that we propose here are not new. We were talking about these way before the crisis as well. Uh, and so um, we, we highlight how um, these are becoming increasingly possible, uh, particularly in the emerging market context as a result of uh, the, uh, this crisis. So the first kind of big area that we focus on is that the digitization of activities uh, and operations can allow lenders to leverage Again, we lost you. Ay, ay, ay. Uh, Leora, it's fine. Just so I hear you. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm afraid it might not be my uh, side that, that, that is challenged, but uh, I wouldn't know how to uh, fix it. Okay, so I'll try to speak even faster so you can hear me uh, more. Uh, can, can you hear me? Just a check. We can hear you, yes. Okay, great. So uh, in, in our survey, we find that 60% of institutions, of financial institutions, had made uh, some type of update to their credit models. Uh, but just one out of seven added capabilities that were significant in terms of integrating alternative data or machine learning risk assessments in their, uh, in their models. So most of it was still kind of fairly manual updates. Uh, and uh, preliminary evidence so far shows us that innovators that have invested heavily in these technologies uh, performed really well through the crisis. We cannot say better because the comparison is challenging, but but really well. And one example, uh, there was a chart, if you, if you move to the next, I think it will appear. Um, yeah, one example is, is one of our uh, clients, Confio in Mexico, which is a, a kind of fintech lender that uses, uh, the, before the crisis, used uh, electronic invoicing data and payroll information to uh, reach small firms uh, and lend to them. 
And we see essentially the Confio over a, a year and a half period essentially doubled its uh, mon uh, monthly loan disbursement. And this is happening after an initial drop in lending following uh, the early months of COVID and a fairly rapid effort to adapt its algorithm to integrate new data on the impacts of COVID-19 on subsectors and rapidly return to growth. So um, we've seen many more of those examples coming across. Another area that we identify is that lenders can adjust and diversify their product offerings to clients. And this can be done in many ways from reducing loan maturities, which can improve visibility, uh, to uh, strengthen kind of product features that can help improve recourse uh, in the case of no repayments. Uh, for example, leveraging alternative forms of collateral or, or enabling automatic payments for, uh, for loans from, from existing cash flows. Um, so uh, another example that it's very much in the press these days is, is the question related to embedded finance and supply chain finance uh, that can be uh, particularly effective in terms of uh, helping with some of this visibility. Um, here, my bank uh, is uh, the, um, it's a bank part of Ant Group in, in China uh, that was focused, that is focused on uh, micro and small enterprise lending. Uh, and the example here is how uh, this institution was able to keep growing. I mean, you don't even see COVID in, the, in, their, in their expansion growth. You, they, they were able to keep growing the amount of uh, uh, MSMEs that they reached and the loans that they were able to provide to MSMEs uh, during this period, uh, thanks to an integration with uh, the e-commerce platform and the payment platforms that are part of the group uh, that were allowing them unique visibility, but also unique uh, recourse uh, opportunity. So I'll, I'll stop here. Um, I thank you for uh, your attention. And if I may take one minute to uh, finish up, um, the fourth area um, that we talk about is delayed resolution of distress, uh, um, elevated risk of sovereign debt, um, which should not be short change, but I know so many other presentations today were on the topic. Um, and simply around that in many countries, both the crisis and the subsequent war in Ukraine, et cetera, have exasperated and exposed deteriorating sovereign debt quality. Um, and drops in, we've also been seeing drops in government revenue that might pose a risk to banks through the bank's high exposures to government debt. Um, and so the importance for these countries to prioritize our guidance, uh, guidance global guidance on how existing debt burdens can be managed more effectively, um, to free up more resources that might be needed for the recovery. Um, and also to avoid and mitigate the significant social and economic costs of sovereign debt distress, um, which have been uh, research has shown are associated with a wide uh, assortment of economic problems, ranging from prolonged recessions to high inflation, which have disproportionate, disproportionate negative effects on the poor. Um, so, for example, as shown in research by Carmen Reinhardt and others, it takes on average eight years for countries to emerge from a sovereign debt default. Um, effective debt management requires debt transparency, again, going back to the theme of better governance, full disclosure of claims and contract terms, contractual innovations, such as collective action clauses and insurance for borrowers against natural and climate-related disasters, and appropriate revenue mobilization through sound tax policies, but also strengthen incentives for businesses to formalize. So please, we, I said uh, take, uh, the report uh, is available. Oops, I'm sorry. The report is available um, on our website, um, and I encourage you uh, to dig deeper uh, into the report's findings. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Laura and Beniamino, for this really, really interesting uh, presentation of, of the report. Uh, and I'm, I'm particularly, as a, as a typical Finnish uh, happy taxpayer, I'm particularly happy with the, with the ending on, uh, on tax, taxes. Next, I would um, like to introduce our, our sp speaker, um, next speaker, who is Abram Stagem. Um, he will uh, give, a, give a short comment on the, on the report and then we can open, open the discussion. Uh, Abrams is a research associate here with the UN wider. 
Uh, he is an empirical development economist, um, focusing on fiscal capacity and development aid and on the application of time series methods. And as I was reviewing your, your bio, I noticed that you really have a broad, uh, broad experience with, uh, with everybody here today, as you have before, also worked for at the World Bank and with the ODI. Uh, Abrams, please go ahead. All right, thank you, Emmy, and nice to see everyone again. I remember Shakira when I was in um, ODI. Um, Sanjay, I didn't meet when I was in Nottingham, but we may have crossed paths, but I didn't know him then. So, and um, I'm very happy to be here. I think I've learned a lot from the debt um, discussion since morning. I mean, the most important of which is that there's too much debt around the world. And we may go back to the BATA system pretty soon, but let's wait and see. So um, I'm happy to have had the opportunity to discuss the World Development Report. It's quite long and interesting. Um, a lot of the discussions or a lot of the, the knowledge in the report is on financial instability and most of the aspects related to the financial sector. So I wasn't going to spend, though I'm not going to spend too much time on discussing that. I would focus more on debt and as Emmy said, on the aspects of tax policy and tax administration. So, so this is the structure of my discussion. Um, I would emphasize a bit on the uniqueness of the COVID-19 pandemic, some brief discussion on the interconnections between sectors, the recommendations which emanated from the World Development Report, and another aspect which I'll call the medium-term fiscal reform plan which is um, basically a kind of reform plan to enhance fiscal space to be able to deal with the debt um, problems which are mounting. So the uniqueness of the pandemic, as if you go through the report, as the first diagram in the discussion showed, um, economic activity contracted in more than 90% of countries. So it res um, resulted in the following issues, financial instability across countries, over indebtedness amongst households and businesses, reduce access to credit and rising sovereign debt issues. So in terms of debt distress and especially based on the composition of the debt, um, there was an increase in internal debt, but also a very large increase in external debt, especially foreign currency denominated external debt. Various policy responses were implemented, ranging from fiscal to financial sector policies but crucially, the efficiency of these policies depended on pre-existing strengths of respective countries. And by that, I mean the strengths of their institutions and equally importantly, the level of fiscal space available in the countries. If you go through the report, you would find that the advanced economies were able to respond better and faster to the crisis than you know, the more developing countries, especially low-income countries. So um, this is um, an extension of the conceptual framework. So on the left, you see what they refer to as a vicious cycle. And on the right, it's a virtual cycle. So the blue is for the government and central banks. The red is for the financial sector. And then the yellow is for households and firms. And as you can see, there are very, very strong interconnections between both. So for example, lower tax revenue resulted in declining fiscal support for distressed households and firms. It also resulted or, um, in counter-cyclical government spending and especially the, develop, um, the difficulty in managing sustainable debt and also the government not being able to incur the state contingent liabilities from inefficient state-owned enterprises. On the right, it's a virtual cycle and all of the happy things about um, a country. And I think we had a conference in May on development and peace. And there was this nice blog about creating the next Finland. So I think the next Finland is some of a virtual cycle. Uh, so we're happy to be here. So higher tax revenue, stronger fiscal support. And again, it leads to, you know, um, the ability to manage government spending and, you know, the ability of the countries to manage their debt and also their state contingent liabilities. So essentially moving from the vicious cycle to the virtual cycle depends crucially on debt restructuring 
but also on the medium-term economic and fiscal reform plan. So these are the recommendations from the report. Managing and reducing loan distress, improving the legal solvency status, ensuring continued access to finance, and one which I found particularly interesting and which I focused on, managing increased levels of sovereign debt. So sovereign debt was, or the debt stock in many countries was really considerably high even before the pandemic. A lot of countries, especially developing countries, were borrowing a lot to be able to fund their development objectives and even to fund their not um, what you can call pro-poor spending in terms of the wages and salaries being paid to their workers. The increased debt levels became a problem, particularly with external debt. So the composition of debt was also very important. Um, you could get bilateral debt from the bilateral donors. For example, the French-speaking countries in Africa get a lot of debt from France. Multilateral debt from the multilateral financing institutions and also the euro bonds. And the euro bonds are particularly important because how they are used is very important in how they can be repaid. So if the euro bonds are used for less development spending, then you have all sorts of risks in terms of interest rates, exchange rates, and also rollover risks. The high risks of debt um, distress in sub-Saharan Africa prior to the pandemic were really exacerbated by pandemic-related spending. Again, because the countries um, were borrowing at higher average borrowing costs, sometimes more than 5% on interest, it uh, resulted in a very large increase in their debt servicing ratios, which constrained their fiscal space and made it almost impossible for them to respond to the inequalities of the pandemic as fast as the advanced countries. So the G20 Common Framework was created for debt restructuring, as well as the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, which was introduced during the pandemic for countries with liquidity issues and which needed debt treatment. So I just copied this diagram from the report. And my focus is on the red one, which is for low-income countries. So as you can see, the share of debt to GDP has been increasing in low-income countries right up to 2020, which is at 67%. Um, the debt being collected by advanced countries is higher than low-income countries. But again, because their debt or their borrowing costs are higher in low-income countries, you would find that um, the debt servicing costs in low-income countries are quite high. I think that's going to be a fundamental part of the discussion tomorrow on the 2020 Financing for Sustainable Development Report. So we look forward to that. So the soaring debt service costs across countries and much higher in low-income countries, it reduced the funds available for spending and it exacerbated inequalities in those countries. Debt restructuring is crucial if countries are going to be able to manage their debts and the IMF and the World Bank are crucial in this procedure because they provide debt sustainability assessments which are a natural first step in trying to restructure your debt. The Common Framework or the G20 Common Framework and the DSSI were also created to help countries. So the Common Framework can coordinate rescheduling for countries with sustainable debt, but with persistent liquidity issues. Coordination amongst the creditors is also very important because it involves uh, multilateral creditors, the Paris Club creditors, and also the non-Paris Club creditors. So in as much as the development institutions may be inclined to coordinate and suspend debt service payments, Sometimes the private um, creditors are not inclined to do that. So coordination in terms of um, how the services, uh, debt service can be suspended, sorry, is very important. So this brings us to a medium term fiscal reform plan in terms of creating more fiscal space to deal with the scarring effects of the pandemic. So managing soaring debt stocks, which I've discussed above, prioritization and efficiency gains of spending, and domestic revenue mobilization in terms of tax policy and administration reforms. So improving efficiency of government spending, it has to deal with an improvement in public spending efficiency and the quality of public procurement. So this can be done to um, digital public financial management solutions in terms of fiscal transparency portals and digital procurement reforms constant auditing of government processes and spending, and also in terms of beneficial ownership. All of this within the backdrop of transparency, accountability, and good governance. 
one thing which happens during a crisis is the, um, there are a lot of parallel systems of spending created. And if um, you know, the efficiency of spending has to be increased, then accountability and transparency are of utmost importance. There was a very big scandal in Cameroon in terms of the amount of money which was disbursed by the IMF for COVID. And um, the presidency handed it to the prime ministry to handle, who then handed it to the Ministry of Finance to handle. And it was a very nice vicious cycle and a loop in terms of pointing fingers and you know, nobody knew where the money went to. So there are auditing processes going on now, but uh, <laughs> I wouldn't hold my breath. So tax policy and administration reform. So this is actually very crucial because we talk about debt and other innovative methods of financing, but those are external and sometimes they are not within the control of the countries. But in terms of your tax policy and administration reforms, the countries are actually in control of that and which I think huge strides can be made into improving our tax policy and our tax administration, which is going to lead to enhanced tax capacity and hence more tax revenue as a share of GDP. So this can be done by targeting on the tax basis, such as excises, property, capital income, as well as exploring untapped basis in terms of carbon emissions, as uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and also the digital economy. Increasing the fairness and product progressivity of existing tax systems, especially capital income, you know, because you have all these high net worth individuals and these strong multinational enterprises that can easily move their the tax um, liabilities from high tax in the, um, countries to low tax countries, and that really has to be catered for. Which brings us to the next point, rethinking international tax rules to stop avoidance by multinational enterprises and high net worth individuals. Developing tax policy to meet other broader objectives like climate change and health. So again, this takes us back to the discussion on carbon emissions which as we are seeing, we are living in an existential or potential crisis, which is going to involve the climate and you know, developing tax policy now to be able to align itself with those climate objectives and other health objectives, like in terms of obesity, you can talk of um, excise taxes and the like, that's also very important. And finally, improving the facilitation and enforcement in tax administrations and digitalization is going to be key here because in the recent World Bank report, it was found that countries that uh, digitalized their tax administrations before the coronavirus pandemic responded much better and most fa much faster than countries which were still dealing on the paper-based system of tax administration. So I think this brings an end to my discussion. Did I use all my five minutes? <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abrams. Mm -hmm. uh, now uh, it's time. Uh, we have some time for... Uh, Questions, comments, uh, who would like to start? Mm. Mm -hmm. oh, whatever. Mm -hmm. ah, thank you. Uh, as always, very, very comprehensive uh, report. Uh, I'm Ike Koronen from Bank of Finland. The one thing that struck me it was the how differently the non-performing loans performed in uh, low-income and lower middle-income countries vis-a-vis uh, -vis rest, rest of the world. And since I, I don't remember if the GDP uh, outcomes were that different in that group of countries, is it because of health outcomes, meaning that the, these countries probably had the, or were the late, last ones to, to have access to, to vaccines and hence the uh, normal sort of functioning of, of, of SMEs and, and service sectors, for example, would probably be hampered. Yeah, I, I don't know if you have any insights on this. Thanks. Laura, would you like to answer that? Sure, Benny, you jump in. Um, one thing to remember is that, sorry, there's an echo. Uh, You can control the echo. Thank you. Um, so, you know, one issue is also that during the pandemic, especially in lower and middle income countries, um, governments and central banks, central banks implemented regulatory forbearance, which allowed firms to not repay. And you know, so there's 
one question around the moral hazard of whether firms, you know, figured they didn't have to pay at all. And so that now that the books are being opened and the transparency is being, uh, there's greater transparency into the true performance of many of those loans, we're getting this sort of bubble of non-performing loans. Um, I mean, and the second piece, yeah, I, I would say going back to the story around digital payments, um, in many lower income countries, so in many high income countries, digital payments became a lifeline, especially for small businesses who were able to pay uh, deli it, between delivery and remote uh, pur online uh, purchasing, which often wasn't available uh, in lower income countries, which might also have uh, led to a slower recovery. Uh, Benny, do you have anything yeah, maybe I'll, I'll add. So I, the, the best line of interpretation I can find is that, first of all, in, in upper middle income countries and high income countries, firms were likely to have a stronger cushion or stronger set of assets to, to face the crisis than, than in lower uh, income markets. Policy support, as Leora said, was significantly more intense uh, in high and upper and middle income markets, uh, both in terms of direct transfer as well as the forbearance work. So uh, it is very possible that some of those MPLs in upper middle income countries are simply not yet seen. Uh, it's not that the, the businesses are doing better. Uh, but I, I, would, I would bring those two. I don't think it's about the health outcomes uh, being differentials. Uh, as a matter of fact, as far as I uh, recall from from the last time I looked at the data, the health outcomes might have been you know were, were worse and more more deeply felt, both in terms of health outcomes, but also in terms of the restrict uh, restrictions to to the economy uh, in uh, for for higher income markets than than the lower middle income ones. Thanks. Thank you. Um, other questions, comments. Anybody else? We could take a few. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Aranhan, IDRC. Um, I have a, when, when the pandemic started, there was a lot of talk, as, as, as happens to be the case in, in emergencies, about uh, building back better. And, and I think we've discovered that a lot of those haven't happened. In my own organization, we introduced a new system for claiming expenses. And people tested during the pandemic, and now we started traveling. So it's not working. Oh, we because we tried it out during the pandemic, and like some of the things actually weren't a particularly good idea to introduce during that emergency. These, it, the, the list of recommendations, and this is also to Abram because of his comment he made on 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 Cameroon. Um, the, the list of recommendations are, and as you said, these were most of these were the case before the pandemic. They're equally relevant, but I'm particularly keen to hear what you would recommend now, and particularly at a time from the international financial institutions when, when so many countries are, have to restructure the debt and, and, and IMF loans you know, have, have certain conditions, is it, is it the right time to focus on these or should we, is it exactly the right time for some of these I can see? Or, or would the recommendation be let, let, let's get through this crisis first and then address those? And, and of course, that may be different for, 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 for the long list of recommendations. But I'd really love to hear a little bit more at this particular time, at a time of crisis, uh, what the priority should be. Thank you. And uh, Rico, we had another one here. And if there's any more, this. Okay. And one more from oh, So I'm Kunal Sen. Um, and thanks so much for a very interesting presentation, Lira and Benjamino. I wanted to kind of raise the question that actually Abrams raised in his presentation, given that now a lot of the, so and there's a last point you made later in your presentation on sovereign debt, given that most of the sovereign debt is now owed to private creditors, how do you get them around the table when they really have very little interest to do so, uh, when there's a collective action problem? So what kind of incentive compatible mechanism can one think about to get private creditors on also talking to, to the Paris Club and others and, and developing country governments when, when you might argue that from their point of view, there really isn't any reason to, to have these discussions. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and then we had one more from here, and with these three, I, hand it, I will hand it over to you. All right, uh, thanks. Uh, Michael, uh, Dankwa, you and you were uh, there. Uh, Abrams, you, you did talk about the DSSI. I, I just wanted you to, uh, uh, you know, throw some more light on that. 
and why that why that many the developing countries why you know many of them did not take advantage of that i mean i, I know I, I know you know a, a couple of countries why you know is that so yeah thanks thank you and uh, laura and Benjamino, if you want to, if you could start, and then I will give you the last words. <laughs> Take the hard ones, Ben. Um, so, yeah, now, around the sovereign debt question, um, I'll just provide the answer that, you know, especially private creditors, transparency is, is, is a greater problem, right? So, um, you know, certainly the World Bank, uh, has been working simply to uh, encourage greater transparency around total debt, which um, you know, is critical in understanding uh, government's you know, true obligations um, and vulnerability. Um, regarding the question about building back better, um, which is, I, I admit our, our own organization is guilty of, of reusing uh, that phrase, um, in many of the recommendations in the report this is an opportunity. You know, so, for example, um, as I mentioned, India, Colombia, many other countries during the crisis um, introduced uh, almost like a Band-Aid, but temporary uh, out-of-court mechanisms for small business um, uh, bankruptcy proceedings, um, which is really important. Right. And so this is a mechanism um, that was sort of brought out of necessity because of the potential uh, overwhelm the overwhelming of the court system, um, but has proven quite effective. So this is something that uh, can be continued, as well as you know, many of the other recommendations um, around you know, establish, and, and which, again, it was the Churchill never waste the, good, the opportunities, but good, never waste a good crisis. Um, you know, many banks have instituted um, non-performing loan departments uh, to address uh, um, vulnerability, late payments, for example. Um, and you know, these are the type of institutional changes you know, which the hope is will be uh, continued and built up um, after the crisis. Although, you know, I, I, I think it's important to say that we're not in a, we, we had, when we wrote the report, we expected to be in the recovery stage now and helping countries in the recovery. Um, whereas unfortunately these, uh, there's still tremendous urgency around many of these challenges, you know, especially um, deteriorating uh, real economic conditions. Benjamin, did you want to comment on something or uh, maybe I... maybe just adding maybe just adding one one quick point? Sorry, I know we're already over time, but uh, with respect to this this last question that, that Leora addressed, I think we we do notice a couple of things. Uh, first of all, much like governments, economies that already had significant made significant uh, progress in terms of digitization of payments and digital infrastructure. Uh, well, you know, still benefit from it. Others, uh, we are actually seeing went, went back to cash in a way. Uh, and so, so some of those solutions, uh, some economies were not ready uh, f to adopt in the long term. And so that's certainly a, a sobering uh, consideration. The other one is that with the tightening of the funding environment that has happened over this past year, a lot of the innovators are actually finding it harder, especially the new entrants in markets that rely on, on capital markets, finding it harder to to grow at the rates that uh, that we had seen even in 2021. So again, another another, uh, I guess not necessarily a response, but another acknowledgement that that as the world you know as these crises continue to evolve, um, um, you know, so does the uh, kind of the set of recommendations. Uh, maybe last point from the very beginning when we worked on the WDR. Uh, we we acknowledged that with an ongoing crisis, there wouldn't be a package of recommendations that would be fitting, uh, you know, all markets. And, and, and Leora led a, a set of conversations with our regional offices, uh, you know, fairly individualized to try to kind of tailor some of the recommendations, uh, region by region, country by country, because ultimately, uh, you know, uh, there's there's the report is so long, and, and the, the list of issues and the list of recommendations are so uh, are so multifaceted that. Uh, that they need to be tailored uh, to each specific context. Yeah, I guess to follow up with what Benny said around um, the so building back better. Um, you know, for example, um, when we talk in the credit section with this, you know, there's a massive adoption of, for example, digital merchant payments during the pandemic. 
um, fintechs enter to be able to in, to offer safer, less risky um, credit products that are tied to the digital payments flow, both as a source of real time economic information, as well as often um, you know, being paid back directly from these digital payment flows, re reduce uh, the, uh, repayment, recourse risk. Um, however, as you also mentioned, we're, we're quickly seeing, especially in places like Latin America, um, people, merchants returning to cash. And that's because of the underlining, you know, going back to especially issues around taxation and formality. Um, and unless countries address these underlying challenges, um, uh, firms and business will be able to take advantage of some of the more uh, innovative technology enables uh, credit products. Thank you. Um, Abrams, uh, short comments. All right. Thank you, Michael. I was kind of hoping my question was going to be on taxation. But, <laughs> um, I think if I were to summarize, um, I think it's going to require some country by country analysis. But one thing you need to remember is that the DSSI was always temporary. So it may have eroded the incentives of countries to you know, request the debt treatment from the creditors. Because the G20 common framework depends crucially on requests from the debtor countries. So they don't just come and then force some treatment on, upon the country. No, you need to request the treatment from the creditors, at which point they'll do a debt, uh, sorry, debt sustainability analysis from which um, they'll determine how your debt gets restructured. If I were to guess, I would say the temporary nature of the DSSI ensured that the countries were not going to request any kind of debt treatment. Um, the Africa's polls, which is um, the flagship report of the African region of the World Bank, showed that even the benefits from the DSSI was going to be like 1% of GDP, which was pretty much trivial, which might explain why the countries didn't request. But if I were to guess, I'd say it's because it was temporary. They had to request, you know, um, debt treatment from the creditors, and which also brings us to collective action problems, like Kunal said. A lot of the creditors are non-Paris club creditors, and maybe the debt contracts have some binding clauses which make it very difficult for the countries to request. But that would be my guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, ha <laughs> we have uh, run out of time, yes, so that's what we are being. Let's, let's continue the discussion uh, over the coffee, but, uh, but before that, thank you very much for our presenters. Let's give them a round of applause. Huh?